when our children were growing up, one of the sweet experiences we had in our lives was catechizing them. Catechizing them. And so we would start them typically as young as three years of age. And we took the children's catechism. It was a, it was a catechism that grew out of uh, Presbyterian and Baptist desires to, to educate children. In fact, telling someone not too long ago, the first time I saw the word, I thought it was a Catholic word because I had grown up in Beaumont, Texas. Some of my friends in school went to the, the Catholic church there, and they had... They had catechism on certain times of the week, and I didn't know what that was. And then my good friend Tom Nettles, when I was in seminary, introduced me to Baptist catechisms. In fact, he wrote a book where he chronicled like 19 or 20-something Baptist catechisms. I discovered that the first, the first document, the first little booklet printed by the Sunday School Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, which is what, what Lifeway was called when, it was, when, when this was first birthed. But the first book was a catechism for boys and girls by John Broadus, a professor at Southern Seminary. And so we would, uh, we would catechize our children. And I want to show you the first, uh, first five questions. I think I have them on slides of the children's catechism. Now, we didn't stop at five, obviously, but, but they were so poignant because they asked critical issues. In a day when, when people think that they came, that their ancestors crawled out of a slimy pool, when people think they're self-made, listen to the God-directed focus of this. Three-year-olds, who made you, we would ask them. What's the answer? God made me. Try that again. God made me. What else did God make, we would ask? Answer, God made all things. Well, why did God you, make you in all things? And this was, this was the, one of my favorite ones in training, because usually when you're training a three-year-old, I don't know what it is in terms of their linguistic capacity, but the, the word glory, the L and the R, are, are not that easy to get on top of. And so here's what would come out for his own glory. And so the, so the speaking of a small child. Why did God make you in all things? Let's answer together. For his own glory. Well, establishing that, if that's true, and the Scripture says it is, we just read it, then how can you glorify God if that's, if that's why God made you in all things? The answer, let's read it together, by loving him and doing what he commands. Straight out of 1 John and many other passages. But then the next question was, okay, if, that's, if the reality is God made you for his own glory, if the question is how can you, then the good question to follow that is why should you why ought you to glorify God? And this, this gets back at the beginning question, who made me? What's the answer? Let's read it together. Because he made me and takes care of me. That is what we taught our children. And all through, all through that uh, catechetic experience, by the way, that they would learn, start thinking in God-centered ways. That was our desire, to think God-centered why is that? Because if you don't intentionally do that, you know who you're going to think about? So what is numero uno is the, is the popular expression. And so I want us to think today, start thinking today about the glory of God. What is the glory of God? Well, there's an Old Testament word for glory, kaboth. There's a New Testament word for glory, doxa. 
And when you start reading through the scriptures, if, you're, if, you're, if your lens is the same, I'm going I'm to read the scriptures to discover what is the glory of God. You don't go very far before you encounter in Genesis 45, 13, Joseph, whose brothers are standing before him, having sold him into slavery. And, uh, and he's now a vice regent of Egypt. He says to them, chapter 45, verse 13 of Genesis, you must tell my father of all my honor. Now, that word honor there in the ESV is the Hebrew word kawod. It's, it's the word for glory in Egypt. And of all that you've seen, hurry and bring my father down here. Joseph wanted his brothers to get his father. So his father, who had mourned over his his untimely passing, so he thought, could see how God had overruled and that that wasn't the case at all. He not only had he not died, he had been placed in a position to rescue the entire family of his father. So you get this flavor of that. In, in the New Testament, the word is doxa, Jesus says in Matthew 6, 2, you get this same idea. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet. He's instruct them in the Sermon on the Mount how to, how to give before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. That, that's the word doxa, that they may receive glory unto themselves. Truly, I say, they have their reward. When the Bible speaks of the glory of God, it's referring to his worth and honor and greatness. And when the word is used of God, we could say it speaks of his own majesty and supremacy. All of creation is designed to glorify God. And their text after text after text teaches that. Romans eleven thirty six simply says, as Paul has come to the end of that great section of chapter 9, 10, and 11, as my professor, great professor Curtis Vaughn used to say, he's, Paul's climbing the mountaintops and he gets to the highest peak in the mountain range and he, this is what he has to say about God. For from him, through him, and to him are all things. All things derive from him. All we receive come through his, his providence, and they all redound back to him. So what else can you say to that? To him be glory forever. Amen. The glory of God. John Calvin said that, that creation, that all of creation is the theater for God's glory. That's what you are. That's what you are. You're saved by God. You're allowed to, to live so that you can display the glory of God. Inanimate creation does it. Look at Psalm 19, 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Think about this a minute. If things he made, of course, if, if you just take a close look at his creation, whether you're, whether you're watching the uh, Aurora Borealis at star show at night or whether you're, whether you're standing before the, the vast oceans of the world or whether you're sailing on them or whether you're in the Grand Canyon or looking at, you just in the Grand Tetons over and over, Niagara Falls. Victoria Falls in, in, in Zambia. You see the glory of God. I want to tell you a funny story. When I, in Zambia, years ago now, we were with Conrad in Bayway teaching and preaching there. I said to him, I said, now, brother, if I come, if I come that far, we're going to go see Victoria Falls. Well, I, I didn't know. He had never seen Victoria Falls. So we get there, and we... And Teaching's about to begin, so we make arrangements to drive to Victoria Falls. And we get back, and, and his, uh, his deacons were talking to some of them, and they said, well, what you been doing? And I said, well, 
Well, Conrad took us to Victoria Falls, and, and they looked surprised and said, what? And I said, yes. He said, well, so Pastor Conrad said that Victoria Falls is just water running over rocks. Now, I'm not saying that to disparage him. He has a fantastic field of view of the glory of God. But he may have made that comment at one time as to why he didn't want to spend the energy. Well, I was there with him at Victoria Falls, and he was overcome with the grandeur of God. The natives in Zambia, when David Livingston discovered it, or, he, or when he found out about it, he didn't discover it, it was there the whole time. They called it Mosiotunya, the smoke that thunders. So wherever you are on the planet, or if you're standing on the planet gazing into the heavens, the heavens declare the glory of God. The earth echoes the reality. And so if, if that's true, then how much more should creatures made in his image, the landscape of the Grand Canyon is not made in his image, the, the mountain ranges of the earth are not made in his image, only one, only one entity created in the image of God. We're his image bearers. How much more should we recognize that we're called to glorify God actively and intentionally? Well, I want to think about it. You know, this is our, our text today, 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Notice how he takes the mundane. We would, we would think, he might say, whether, whether you go on mission around the world, whether you find yourself brought under persecution, whether you have the wherewithal to be very benevolent and very charitable, do these things to the glory of God. But I want to submit to you, unless you were late running out the door this morning, you ate you drank. Some of you need your coffee to get going. Whether you eat, whether you drink, that's about as mundane as it gets, but guess what? That's about as regular as it gets. There are days that will pass that you and I will not exercise. There are days that will pass that you and I will not spend the amount of time reading in the scriptures that, that we desire to spend. There are days that will pass that, that can happen where you're not having family prayer. We could go on down the list. There are days that will pass that you won't engage anyone intentionally with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But unless you're engaged in a fast, days do not pass when you don't eat or drink. We're going to leave this room few minutes. We're going to go eat and drink. So, so Paul is challenging them. And of course, the context of the passage is that over meal, food offered to idols, and how, to, how do you handle that in, in liberty? But the principle here is universal because the idea of glorifying God is universal. When you think about doing God's glory, our doing in God's glory. You hear the Psalms, and the Psalms, by the way, are just replete with these admonitions. Psalm twenty-two, twenty-three: 23, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. We're the offspring of Jacob spiritually. We're not descended from him physically, genealogically necessarily, but we're the offspring of Jacob spiritually. Glorify him and stand in awe of him are you offspring of Israel. Psalm 29, 2. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness, of his holiness. We're called upon to do that. 
when we gather together like this, when you have your family devotions, when you have your private devotions, we're to worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. We're to acknowledge his glory, his strength, which is due unto him. You and I, there's, there's no one called upon to ascribe that to us. We're frail creatures of dust, sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, creatures made the image of God, image bearers, but to the God who made us, we're called upon to do this. How do we do this? And I want to I touch this real quickly, and then we're going to wrap up for, for today. How do we do this? Well, we glorify him in our inner lives and in our bodies. 1 Corinthians 6.20, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. With our praise. Psalm 50.23, the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. The one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. Through our daily lives, the works of our daily lives, Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that you may, they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. Did we do that this past week? We got beyond New Year's Day. Some folks went back to work and back in the routine. The kids went back to school later in the week. Are we showing forth? The glory of God. Are we, as image bearers, are we, are we light reflectors? When people encounter us, do they go away thinking, Boy, I need to know more about that person, God. In our suffering, 1 Peter 4, 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. And our brothers and sisters in China are doing that as well as many Christians around the world are doing that. Don't be ashamed, but glorify God in suffering. Even in our death, when we come to die. John 21, 19, Jesus was speaking to Peter. Told him how his end would come. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. We die. We live. We die. Glorifying God. Will we glorify God in our death? And then he said to him, follow me. You see, if we follow Jesus Christ, if we love God and love others and do that by following Christ, Eyes fixed on Christ, praying to be more like Christ, more filled with Christ, more conscious of Christ, remembering Jesus Christ. And even when we come to die, we will glorify God in our death, in everything we do. Well, I want to stop right there because this, this idea this teaching is too massive, too constricted. I just want to plant that thought in your heart, and I want to challenge you before we get back together to, to think more on 2019, resolve to live to the glory of God. I want you just to do your, your own Bible study on the glory of God. See what you discover along the way, and we'll come back and dig through this, but I'll, my prayer for all of us the 2019 will be a year that we will, we will intentionally engage like never before. Whatever we eat, whatever we drink, whatever we do, whatever we say, we will intentionally undertake for the glory of God. That means we'll go eat this fellowship meal for the glory of God. It means we'll pill our heads tonight, glorifying God. It means we'll rise in the morning realizing that he's given us life to see another day, and we will commit ourselves to glorify God. We're able to do that, by the way, because he sent Jesus Christ to live and die and rise again in our place, giving us that heart of flesh beat for him. Without that, we will not ever have a desire to glorify God. Let's pray. 
Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we come to you today in Jesus' name. And Oh, God, help us live to your glory. We know, we know that if heaven is our home, that heaven will be taken up with the unending, eternal, comprehensive, giving glory to God and to the Lamb by the Spirit. Oh, Father, help us. While on this dusty earth, going through this veil of tears, to engage in that most noble of activities. Help us to further understand it, to see how it works itself out in our daily lives so that you might look down upon a people who are living for your glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand and sing.